ASU for um, about, it'll be a year in May. So um, I'm a lot closer to you guys than I am like being in the industry or anything. So I'd love to just chat about the different things and I'm sure you guys all have a lot of good experiences yourself as well. Um, so to just kind of start it off, uh, I'll go through my normal story. So um, this is like a, a nice looking family, right? Um, well, three years ago, uh, they didn't look like this. Um, Jessica, right here, was pregnant with Eli. And about four weeks before Eli's due date, um, Jessica started to experience some abdominal pains and some headaches, and um, so she went to the doctor. She went to the emergency room. And her doctor met her there, along with Matthew, her husband. And within, after a few tests, within minutes, um, the doctor prescribed an emergency C-section. Um, and within minutes, Eli was delivered, and Jessica's life was, in fact, saved. Um, and if she hadn't been able to have access to that facility, to the doctors, to the health care that she needed, um, she would have died. She was suffering from a um, severe syndrome called preeclampsia, which would have resulted in a um, ruptured liver or a stroke, both of which would have resulted in her death. Um, but that's not what happened. Um, she was able to leave the, doc leave the hospital, and now she's been alive to see Eli laugh, or to see him cry, to see him be silly, um, to see him love, and to see him uh, grow up. Um, and now she's even been around to have a second one, and even a third one is on the way. So this is actually what they look like today, and I'm very happy. And uh, this is actually my family. So, Jessica is my sister-in-law, and Matthew is my brother, and um, this experience really kind of woke me up to the reality that there's a lot of complications that can happen during pregnancy or soon after, and only because Jessica had access to that care that she needed did she survive. I mean, if she had died three years ago, my life would have drastically changed, and so would have my brothers. Um, so that's really... I mean, that's kind of like the story that is my life um, because she didn't join the 800 other women who are going to die today due to complications during childbirth or soon after. 95% um, of those deaths occur in developing countries. Um, and so that, and, and it's the reality that most of these girls, um, it's more likely for them to die during childbirth than it is for them to even attend high school. So though they might not be high school age when they get pregnant, like they might be older, but it's likely that they wouldn't have gone to high school and that they would die during childbirth. And so these are things that three years ago I didn't know. Um, I was just kind of going along and uh, I did know that there were problems around the world, but um, my own personal experience woke me up to these things and I started to learn more about this. And so that's why um, in the fall of 2009, um, well, a little bit later than that, uh, I started G3 Box with three of my friends. And what we do is we take um, steel shipping containers that look like that, and we convert them into medical clinics, which look something like this. Um, and that all started out of a program at ASU called EPICS, which stands for Engineering Projects and Community Service. How many, have you guys heard of EPICS? Okay, so a few of you have. Um, it was in fall of 2009, was, that was the first year they started it. And I thought, yes, that's what I want to join because the reason I chose engineering was because I wanted a challenge and I wanted to help people. And so I really wanted to be involved in long-term projects. Um, so this is the team uh, that we started with. Uh, this is Billy on the right, uh, Gabby, and then Clay. Um, and usually Gabby and I do kind of the tag teaming when it comes to talking and telling people about the story. Uh, but we just really, we're all back, all of our backgrounds are in engineering. Um, we didn't really know what it meant to start a business. If you had asked us when we first started at ASU, are you going to start a business? Uh, we wouldn't have, I mean, first of all, people don't really ask you that question when you start out in engineering. I think that's starting to maybe change. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with what's happened over the past three years in entrepreneurship and engineering coming together, kind of like what's going on with this these clubs I hear, which is really good. Um, 
but we wouldn't have characterized ourselves as entrepreneurs. Um, but since then, we've gone to, uh, in fall or in the summer of 2011, so this was not last year but the year before, we went to Africa, we went to Kenya and Malawi in order to kind of get some on the ground um, research done about would a containerized solution be acceptable to those areas and to those cultures. Um, we've also been featured in multiple media outlets. Um, we've been finalists in over 10 national competitions, winning about four of them. Um, some of the bigger, the names of magazines which I had no idea existed like three years ago, such as Entrepreneur Magazine, Inc. Magazine, Fast Company, those are things I didn't even know about and we were able, we were featured in those and it's something that I think is really important to kind of encourage other students to know about what is going on out there um, because as engineers we don't always self-identify that way and then, actually I guess I should ask, so who in here is engineering? Okay, and the rest of you are in other majors or like business specifically? Just something other than engineering? What's that? You're in entrepreneurship. Okay, great, cool. Right, okay. Yeah, the reason I ask simply because like you guys might know about some of these things when you start out or you might become aware of them, but what I found is that in engineering, there's really not that much information about it, when in reality, engineers are the most common people to have started a company because we like th create something or invent something, and then, but eventually someone else either runs the company. Um, doesn't always happen, and some of the best CEOs are uh, engineers, but um, anyways, that's kind of a side note. So something that I noticed is that I didn't know about a lot of these things, and then after being in Epics and applying to different competitions, all these things came onto my radar. Um, so one of the biggest drivers of our success has been the Edson Student Entrepreneur Initiative, which uh, Jake already mentioned earlier. Um, and they provide, as he said, um, funding, office space, and mentorship. And I know that, how many, how many of you are considering or have an idea that you think maybe you could you would start uh, a business out of someday. Okay, so that's awesome. By the way, that's fantastic. That's like fifty percent, which is really good. Um, if you had asked me when I first started doing this, I would have thought like I would have said, "Oh, money is what we need um, because we have to like create a prototype. We have to get it out there. We need to like make a website. We need to do these things." A lot of which can be done for free, but that's what I would have probably said is, oh, money, that's what we need to get to the next level. When what I found is that these two elements of the Edson program, the mentorship and the office space, have been actually probably more important than the funding. We didn't go through the money as quickly as we thought, mostly because we have a really big product, so the money that we got didn't really crack the surface at needing to get it built. We ended up getting that um, built for free, but um, as far as all the other opportunities that we've gotten, they've been because of the mentors that we've gotten through the Edson program and because we've had a really legit place to meet. So when it comes to office space, you can now bring high profile people to that space up at Skysong. I'm not sure if you guys have seen Skysong. It's pretty, it's like a half an hour from here. I came from here, came from there, so I know. But um, that, it makes your credibility and your legitimacy look a lot better when you're not just always meeting in a coffee shop or at your house or something. So that's a big deal. Um, so I would highly encourage those of you that raised your hands to kind of get down to it, write that business plan up and submit it. And um, even if you don't have like everything figured out, just do it and at least it's practice. Um, we applied like with a week, within a week of the deadline and um, we had thought through a lot of different things but those four of, uh, the four of us that you saw up there, we were on two separate teams and we came together to apply for Edson because we were both working on containerized solutions um, and we had only met as a team uh, like the Thursday or like the Monday before Edson was due. So it'd be like you guys meeting with two other, like three other people 
in like three weeks or it's due on the first, I think, right? Um, you know, meeting at like the end, like right after spring break and then just putting a business plan together. So, and that's not to say that that's recommended. Like I'd recommend spending more time on it. Um, but what it does show is that you probably have thought through this more than you think and go ahead and try. So there's my plug for the Edson program. And we won that in, that was the first time was 2011, 2012. And then we also are this year, 2012, 2013. So we'll be done with the Edson program um, come June. OK, so this is next. Oh, OK. So how did we get, um, I'm going to show you some pictures later of our prototype. But I want to um, mention kind of how we got to this point. And what happened was we got connected up to DPR Construction and Smith Group JJR, which is an architecture and engineering firm. And they really liked what we were doing um, because three years ago when we started in Epix, um, our goal was to convert a container into a maternity clinic for um, Kenya. And they heard about that, and so we talked to them, and they really liked that. So this first clinic was not going to be used for profit. You know, we weren't going to sell it or anything. And they really liked what we were trying to do. And they're both known for kind of being forward thinking and trying to new, new, do new things. So they actually agreed to do two clinics um, for free. So we already had two shipping containers, but um, they basically donated all their time, expertise, labor, and materials to do that which has been a huge deal. And it's taken longer than we anticipated simply because everyone's doing it for free and so you can only expect so much. But um, it's been a huge deal. I mean, that's over like $200,000 worth of everything that they've done, including some design work. Um, so my point in saying that is we didn't get here alone. I mean, we, and when I say here, I'll get into that a little bit more later, but here isn't even that like spectacular. So like as far as, oh, I'm a social entrepreneur, or I've done all these things. In reality, our proof of concept and getting our clinics on the ground will, will really officially happen this summer. So we're by no means successful or um, you know, have a lot of proven, a track record of being successful. It's more about we're trying to build a system that could replicate itself multiple times over in the future. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like to convert containers. Um, this is the first one that we got, and then this is the, the second one, which is actually going to be going to Kenya this summer. Um, and just, I wanted to show you a few pictures of what it can look like to do this. Um, this is what that, the maroon one looks like on the outside right now. They're going to be painted, actually, within the next couple days. Um, and then this is, what, this is what it looked like a few weeks ago inside. Um, and then this is what we did. This is what it kind of looks like now. Um, we still we staged these pictures, so it, um, we're actually outfitting it with equipment in um, with a group in Boston, and then it'll go to Kenya. But you would not ever think that that's inside a shipping container. Um, it looks a little bit narrow, but uh, it's really perfect for having like two kind of uh, exam rooms on each side, and then a little nurses and doctor station in the center. Um, and we were really proud of what's come out of this. And we have a lot of good information going forward for what this is going to look like. Um, because even though this looks really good, there's still things that we could have done differently, that we could have done better. But you really can't know that until you do it. Um, so building a prototype and doing, just getting out there and doing something is a big deal. And um, I would highly recommend that to kind of prove your concept. Um, and then also, don't be afraid to ask people to, to help you in that. But the reason why DPR and Smith Group agreed to this was because they liked the story and because they were compelled by the cause that we were trying to um, address. So it's really important in whatever you're doing to have that in mind first. So don't just say, oh, I made this, this really cool new phone that people can use to um, you know, do what they need to do to get done every day. You want to, you start with why you built the phone. And is it to make sure that people can connect their families more readily, that when um, a crisis happens for someone, they can call someone? You know, you start off with the emotional compelling, which as an engineer, like, I didn't really go there at first. But I realized that's really what we were using to compel people with, was the story. That's why I started with my sister-in-law. I didn't just go straight into 
the clinic. Um, so our team's grown a little bit, but uh, there's our, you know, go devils um, being inside the container there. So this is a better example. This is an actual maternity bed. So this is what our clinic will look like when it's um, that it's going to when it's going to Kenya. Um, so that's kind of the G3 box side of the talk. Um, and I'm not sure. I just got my phone out, but. It's 12.28, so I think I'm doing pretty well on time. But I don't want to bore you guys too much. Um, and I'd love to get some questions and stuff going. But I thought I'd run through um, some things that I learned throughout my time at ASU. Um, and I didn't, this is coming from a different presentation that I did before. Um, so I tried to make it you know, relevant for today and everything. But um, I, I asked the question, but how did it, you know, how did all of this happen? And because you know, three years just doesn't go by and all of a sudden you have a company and you're kind of getting to where you're going to be doing this full time and people are going to be helped and saved. Um, so I wanted to share with you a few things that I thought really helped me get to the point where I am um, but, and that you might want to take into consideration as well. Um, and, but I'm not giving you a recipe for success because I don't think there is such a thing. Um, because success is highly dependent on your circumstances, your environment, you know, things can happen that you don't anticipate that even if you did everything the way I did or the way Steve Jobs did or the way someone else did, you're not necessarily gonna get to that same point. So the reason I'm putting these together is simply because I thought it's what created the environment that got me to this point. Um, so there's nine things, uh, and I won't read through all of them right now, but I'll just kind of go by um, one by one. So start with a vision. And this was something that I think everyone should have in their life, not just for a business. Um, because often the thing that you end up doing, whether it's working for someone else or if you're going to work for yourself, um, you have to know where you want to be personally, too. So what is it that got you to this point? And then, um, that can be a big indicator of the type of company or the type of project that you want to build, or even the type of life that you want to have, the type of job that you want to have. Um, so first off, why did I choose engineering? I told you this already, um, because it's what I tell everyone when they ask me how, why did you choose engineering? And it's because I, I wanted a challenge, I wanted to help people, and I wanted to be like my dad, because my dad could answer any question that I asked him or he could tell me an approach that would, um, where I would have to find the answer myself. And I really thought that was cool because I was always asking him questions when I would be helping him doing, doing different things. And he got a degree in electrical engineering. So I thought, well, maybe I'll get a degree in engineering and then maybe I'll know some stuff and learn some ways in which I can answer those types of questions. Um, and uh, I chose mechanical, not electrical, uh, because I wanted to see what I built rather than just have it be behind walls and stuff um, and get tinier and tinier, which is, you know, kind of my reasoning, right? Uh, but I, don't, I also don't think you have to have, like, an engineering degree in order to be able to answer those questions. You just have to be a learner, and that's what's really important. Um, so then, so that was kind of my vision, was I wanted a challenge, I wanted to help people, I wanted to be like my dad. That does not mean, that doesn't equal mechanical engineering, you know? But it equaled a decision, or it equaled something that affected or influenced my decision to choose mechanical engineering. Does that make sense? So just, there's things that you decide and you're resolved to do that end up influencing how you make your decisions. Um, and then this was, um, something that I kind of developed for myself, prize being well-rounded. So engineers have a lot of stereotypes attached to them, such as like not being able to talk or communicate or write, or be socially, they're socially awkward, um, or you know, they're always sitting at their computer or something. So that's all fine, like there's nothing wrong with those things. And actually, people who aren't engineers can be a lot of that as well. Um, but I wanted to go outside of just engineering. So I um, participated in um, different clubs. Um, I took a dancing class. You know, I just did different things. So I just recommend 
that. I mean, I don't, I'm talking to the choir kind of right now because you guys are already involved in something that's a little different. Um, and, uh, but I did look to those that were a little further ahead of me to see what it was that I kind of wanted to look like. So I looked at seniors or just people that were further along and um, I noticed that they were good students, they were involved, um, they had leadership positions and they had really good time management. Um, and I wanted to be like them and so by the time my senior year came around, um, I kind of did and in a way that I didn't anticipate. Um, it was even more what I wanted, it wasn't just what they looked like. Um, so it was just something to keep in mind, you know, think about where you want to be and then um, sort of the, what is it, the statistic that if people write down their goals, they're more likely to actually complete them. So it's that type of thing. And then um, another thing that I recommend is creating an environment of opportunity because you can't make things happen, you can't force things to happen. You can try really hard and everything, but it's really about creating an environment where opportunities like hit you in the face or you're going to be aware of them. Um, so getting involved is one of them. Um, here's a few examples of what happened in my, um, if you track what happened to me. So I decided to, I was involved, I um, was in the Honors College, so I was doing um, research through the Fulton Undergraduate Research Initiative in order to work on my thesis. And because of that, I worked with um, a PhD student which then got me an internship at um, PADT, which stands for Phoenix Analysis and Design Technologies. And that was in the summer of 2010. And I still work there. So, along with G3Bucks. But I still work at PADT, and all because of that internship. If I hadn't um, chosen to do Fury, if I hadn't been doing that, I would have never worked with this guy who then said, hey, the company I'm working for is looking for an intern, and I thought of you. So it's just something to be aware of. You know, create, um, think about what you can be involved in to where you might meet someone that someday might recommend you for something. Um, and then also, that's where Epics came, came about. And because I was involved in Epics, uh, oh yeah, this is the story of, um, well, what I was gonna say is because I was involved in Epics, I'm doing G3Box now. So that's not exactly a straight line correlation, but if I hadn't enrolled in that first class, I don't think I would be working on G3Box. I might be working on something else, but not G3Box. So just think about, like, everything's really connected, and so the decisions you're making now influence where you're gonna be in the future. Um, but, and one of those big things was I, was, I had to go outside of my comfort zone here, because um, I had to make what's called a cold call, and if you're in sales, then you know exactly what this is. But how many of you guys have heard of, what a, of a cold call? OK, so a cold call is calling someone up that you don't know, they don't know you, they have no idea that you're going to call. It's a complete cold call. So the relationship is cold. There is no, uh, there's no one to connect you. There's no one to you know, introduce you. Um, it's what salespeople have to do all the time. And so it's your job to like, make people interested. Well, I was like, I'm in engineering. Like, I don't ever want to have to do that. So I called up Swift Transportation because this was back in the fall of 2009 when we were working on this container project. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And so I thought, well, maybe I need a shipping container. So I called them, and, along with some other companies. But they were the ones that actually listened to me. And um, that's how we got our first container. So that yellow container that you saw back there um, in the earlier pictures, um, was from Swift, because they just had it laying around. So they're like, oh yeah, we've got one. And so it resided at the ASU Tempe campus, the northeast part of campus, for like two years. And then it got moved to the DPR facility to get all their work done on it. Um, and then that other clinic that you saw is going to be going to Kenya. So it just shows you, if I hadn't called them, this wouldn't have happened. You know, there's a lot of things that maybe it would have been done in a different way. Um, but then that led to winning some competitions at ASU, and then G3Box launched out of that. So this is kind of what I realized created that environment was um, seeking advice, uh, getting involved, be willing to step outside your comfort zone, you know, make that cold call, walk up to someone. Engineers are often characterized as being very you know, introverted as well. Um, I know that maybe that doesn't apply to you guys, and it doesn't also apply to a lot of engineers, but go out there and just do something. Um, 
and then do the hard things is what I said. So that can be tied very closely to being outside your comfort zone, but something like applying to a competition, um, it took a lot of, we had to really sit down and write, write everything down and um, took some time. But what it ended up doing was getting us, it, we won it. And if we hadn't ever even applied, then we would have never had that opportunity. So it's just going a little bit further, stepping a little bit farther to get where, where you hope to be. Um, I kind of already talked about this. Yeah, so do stuff outside of engineering. I already talked about that a little bit as far as getting involved. Um, and sorry, this was tailored more towards engineers when I first put the presentation together. So that's why I talk about that a lot. Um, and then build a network. So I really um, recommend you having people who are alongside you, so your peers, like everyone here, people who are ahead of you, such as your professors or um, other people outside of the ASU network. Um, and then you might not think of yourself this way, but, but um, always have people that are a little bit behind you, if you will, in life. Whether that's other um, students or other people around you, you know, brothers and sisters that are younger than you, um, or even sometimes your peers as far as age, um, like they see you as someone to look up to still. So be aware of how you're influencing others, not just um, how others can like, help you get to where you want to be. So I just really encourage to, you to be aware of the people around you and try and create that network because it's the network that we have created around G3Box that have, that's allowed us to really get to the point where we're at. Um, and then six, I was saying that um, the big things happen in small ways. So the theme that I've already mentioned a little bit is be aware of the decisions that you're making um, because they could lead to big things. So I ended up, I went to, um, I went to France in uh, 2009, and that's all because I just attended an info session about the Honors College um, study abroad thing, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll go. But if I hadn't gone to the info session, then I probably wouldn't have gone to the trip. And that was just a little, it was a matter of staying on campus like an hour longer. It's a tiny little decision. You know, I could have just gone home. And then um, I went to, you know, the epics thing that was like, okay, I'm going to sign up for this class. Don't really know if it's going to be what I think. And then you have G3Box. Um, and then I went to Chandler Gilbert before um, I was at ASU. Um, well, I was still in high school, actually, and I did some classes there. And it's because of a math class I took, in addition to, you know, my goal of trying to be like my dad. Um, but the calculus teacher I had was um, really supportive of engineering. So if I hadn't done that, then I might not have gone into engineering. And then uh, we've got a clinic today because of a cold call to Swift. So these are little decisions that you make that you don't really think about that um, could change where you end up being. So don't overthink it, but just be aware that going the extra mile or doing something a little bit outside your comfort zone can take you to a place that you just never dreamed. Um, and then I included this into the um, big things happen in small ways because Project Local and Doc in the Box were the two teams that um, joined together, like I mentioned, and then formed G3Box. So if we hadn't just decided to apply to the Edison competition a little bit on a whim, um, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Um, like I said, so we wouldn't have won Edson. That's kind of a, an old team picture, but... Um, Okay, and then there's something that I always recommend too, is always reflect. And um, I always like it when I have the opportunity to talk to people because it does require me <clears throat> to look back on my own experiences. And you really realize how far you've come or what you need to do, what you need to change for the future if you look back. And you know, this could look different for all of you. It could be writing things down in a journal, it could be, um, making your calendar really detailed so that you know what you did that day, um, one, jotting down one or two thoughts, but just kind of be aware of what you've done. Because if you're all kind of in the college age range or um, around that, it's still, your life's still been pretty significant up to this point. That's um, you know, 20 to 25 years of your life. Oh, I forgot to put this in here. So I thought I'd just share a few of the quotes that have inspired me. Um, 
so I'll just go into them. But I really like this one. It says, if you want to have what others do not have, you must be willing to do what, um, to do what others are not willing to do. And this is by um, an author named Ted Decker. And this was actually in a fiction book, but I really, it stood out to me. Um, and he actually uses it in a little bit of a negative sense, uh, like someone who's a little obsessed. But when you think about it, we're kind of obsessed in a way when it comes to how we approach things, if you really want something. Um, but you have to be willing to do what others aren't. Otherwise, you're kind of going to be the same. Which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you're going to be the same. And then um, this is actually a quote from um, one of my pastors. But he said, what is the thing that you do that when you're done, though you're pooped, it's the good kind of poop? And I just love that because, first of all, it captures his personality, but it also shows that, you know, there's some days where you're, you've finished and you're just, like, super, super tired, and you're, and you're actually tired. Like, you just want to kind of forget the day and you just want to go to sleep. And there's other times where you're super tired, but you felt like that was the best day ever. I, I it was so diverse. I got all these things done, and I loved it. Um, that, those are the things, like, what did you do that day? Pay attention to that because those are probably the things that inspire you and where you can find your passion. Um, so that I just really like that one. And then um, I love Isaac Newton. You know, maybe it's because I'm in engineering, but I liked him before I was in engineering. So, but I love this quote from him, and he said, um, "I do not know what I may seem to the world." But to myself, I seem to have just been like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lie all undiscovered before me. And I love that because here's a guy who, um, you know, those are some controversy about whether he truly discovered calculus first or whatever, but he discovered calculus. He has a lot of about optics, um, you know, his laws of gravity, everything. And yet, he still saw himself as someone who has a great ocean of truth yet undiscovered. So someone who did all of that still saw there's much more to be learned and there's much more to be done. I don't think he was using this to be depressed or anything. He was just saying like, look, don't ever settle for the things that you've already done. There's still much more to be there. I, f I find it actually kind of a humble viewpoint. So I thought I'd share that. Um, and then finally, this is the last lesson, um, is make sure that you give credit where it's due. So a lot of times, and um, maybe it's because I'm in, I, I'm a girl and I was in engineering. And the thing about girls is that we can be catty, you know, we can be like, oh, I want to, uh, you know, we hold on to grudges or we like, oh, I don't like you because of this thing or her hair was like that or whatever. And I didn't do that as much, you know, as far as like the hair stuff, but there were other things. And um, so this is maybe more to like girls, but don't be caught up in what, if, whether you're the one that gets the credit for something that you do. And that's something that everyone can really, I think, take as good advice. Because if you're caught up in that, you'll actually hinder whatever it is that you're trying to get done. Because then it's about you. It's not about what you're trying to get done. So it's just something that I really um, encourage. And so with that, um, I don't know what you guys think about like me being up here. And it's like, oh, I'm the speaker, so I'm supposed to be maybe like further along or I have better, you know, more experience or something. And though it might be true that I have more experience in different areas, it's not because of anything that, like I couldn't have controlled me getting here. Um, I did make decisions and I did, and I am responsible for those things, but really um, my faith is a really strong component of my life. Um, I'm, a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I believe that he's a huge part of, I, he is the reason that I get up every day and he's, um, you know, my meaning. And without that, then I would know I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And so I don't say that to be like all weird and like make people freak out or whatever, um, but it is true. And so I want to make sure that because that's really where the credit's due. It's not in me as a human being able to like do all these things because I don't believe that I'm anyone's savior spiritually or physically. So those women in Kenya, I feel very strongly for and I want to do something to help save their lives. But I know that my identity isn't wrapped up in whether I do that or not or whether I 
succeed at it. Um, and my identity isn't wrapped up in G3 box. And so it's just something that I wanted to throw out there too because we oftentimes can get caught up in thinking, well, if I don't get my degree in engineering, or if I don't finish, or if I don't um, have this business that's successful, we take failure really hard. And I'm just saying, make, like, that's where, my, that's where I give my credit to, and I'd love to talk to you, any of you guys about that a little bit more, if you'd like, later. Um, but if I didn't say that, then you guys would all think, oh, you're, you think that people can do anything. Well, I think they need help. So, um, uh, yes, this is my vision to see G3 Box all over the world. Um, and I'd love to see these companies sponsor a clinic, you know, Intel, Nike, Walmart. I'd love to see all of that happen. Um, but in the end, my goal is that the smiles on these girls' faces will still be there in 10 years, in 20 years. And they'll be alive to have their children, and that their children will be healthy, and that they will be able to grow up as well and learn and grow and love. So that's why G3 Box is here, and that's why I'm here. So thank you very much. I'd love to have any questions. Could you go back and show the map? Yeah. You went real quick, and I was interested. Uh, it's just kind of arbitrary. It's, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just, I just put G3 Box clinics all over. Oh, okay. um, I mean, I'd like to see it. I really would. I think this has an application all over the world. Um, and what's cool about shipping containers is that they are all over the world already. So you can find them. You just got to be able to have the resources there to convert them. Um, and that's really what we're working towards. Um, so yeah, any questions I'd love to have? Can I see the sponsor slide, please? Here, yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, and then I added a little, like, it all circles around there, too. Um, yeah, so the idea is that we get sponsorships and funding from existing corporations. Um, you funnel it through the G3Box solution, which is the container clinics. And then they get sent to um, no existing nonprofits on the ground. So these are examples of those nonprofits. Yeah. Um, so right now we're actually an LLC. Um, we uh, have, we are planning on going into a nonprofit status as well, though. Yeah. Are you licensing the technology to other people to send out? Um, actually, it's funny you say that. We're actually talking on Friday with a potential company that to license it out, um, but we'll see how that goes. So it. it Converting containers isn't anything new. So really what we're focusing on is developing the system where if you convert a container here, you'll be able to get it anywhere in the world as a clinic with medical supplies that it needs and everything. My last question is, have you done any involvement with manning these stations, uh, medical professionals and stuff? Are they volunteering their time or um, employed by UN or whatever? Yeah, so we'd love to have the UN connect in with what we're doing. Um, but right now, uh, we're working with existing organizations on the ground in those developing countries that run, either run existing clinics or hospitals, um, so they'll be the ones staffing it. So they'll actually have an operating cost associated with the clinic. Um, they could have systems in place where medical professionals do donate their time, but um, more likely than not, the goal is to create something that's of the community. So having medical professionals um, work out of the clinic that are from the community. Does that make sense? Yeah. So rather than like a doctor from the US going there to um, volunteer, they'd actually have um, community health workers from that area working in the clinic. So eventually it becomes a, su a sustainable unit on its own. Um, have you looked into the military? Yeah, we have looked into the military a little bit. Um, one thing that I've learned over the past year is that you have to decide like one path and then let other things happen along the way. And so we were really focusing on like 20 different things. And we decided, OK, we really just have to focus on getting these to developing countries. And the military thing wasn't quite like, it was just a lot more obstacles than smooth sailing. So we've gone some other routes right now. But I think that it's definitely an option for the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, he, 
he asked, um, or he said he's looking at starting a nonprofit. And so, what are some of the pitfalls and things that I've run into as far as, seeing, as far as getting registered? So, um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things that I would recommend is um, you can go to. I mean, you might have already, but you can go to the Arizona Commerce Authority and get all the documents um, that you need in order to know how to file. But um, there's a lot of, uh, actually, Courtney Klein, she would have been perfect for this question because she has a whole um, set of documents that she uses to like help people start a nonprofit. So if you're interested, I can check with her and I could actually send you some of that stuff. But um, really what I'd focus on is making sure that you understand what your mission truly is um, and then that you're able to build your story out of that because that's really what um, is going to get you into the tax exempt status. Because you can file as a nonprofit corporation, um, but if you don't apply for your tax exempt status, then no one can get tax deductions when, you, um, give to, when they give to you. So just be, um, really make sure that you got all of that, all of your, like what, you, what it is you really want to be, kind of tacked down. Um, but don't be afraid to like go for it even if you don't, you don't have everything. But it's something that I would recommend is maybe giving it some time to um, get everything kind of solidified. And if you're already there, then go for it because it's easy to fill out the um, documents if your story is clear. Because um, that's really what you're doing is you're telling the IRS a story. And they have to feel like um, that you're going to be helping society. And not just feel like, you really should be helping society, but um, you just need to be able to convey that well. And uh, the reality is, though, the IRS is working like 11 months behind, I think. So there are ways of getting the tax exempt status um, more quickly. But you probably want to anticipate that it'll be about a year before you actually have your, your status. That's just what I've learned. Three, yes. I should. So that's the tax exempt part of it. Yeah. So I have a question. So let's say you are able to get any sort of resources right now. What is like your dream, like top four or five things that you feel like you need right now that would allow you to grow quicker? Yeah. Okay. Um. So she asked. She. We can't hear back here. Okay. Um. So she asked, what are if if I had access to any resources right now that I could have. What, what are the top five, three or five things that um, I would say would really launch this thing? So um, we actually have a lot lined up, but I would say a um, really strong corporate sponsor would be excellent. Someone that's willing to say, I want to sponsor these clinics and these communities so that um, this isn't just something that happens once and then never happens again. Um, but that they're willing to commit to the capital cost required for 10, 10 units um, for this year, uh, which is about a $1.2 million goal. And then um, what that does is it allows us to build those units, get them on the ground, and then the second thing that I'd like, which is um, relationships with, say, the Kenyan government or the Malawian government, one of the um, country's governments that we want to get into, and be able to pitch to them um, how this will not only save their citizens' lives, um, but that it'll, it'll be cheaper for them in the end. Um, and people will now live in order to invest in their economy. So that's, so one is a corporate sponsor, two is access to those governments. Um, and then I'll probably, I'll just give another one, um, which is, it's probably, um, a really good, like someone who's experienced in fundraising. Um, Cause I can go out and I can talk about this stuff and I get, I can tell the story and I can show why I'm passionate. But uh, sometimes when it gets down to the nitty gritty of like calling up people and doing all these things, um, I can do that. But that would be what, another thing that we would really like access to right now is someone who um, really believes in the cause and um, can then kind of be a, a spokesperson for us. Um, in that way, or at least get us the meetings that we need in order to get into there. But really, at this point, that's something kind of, that's a little bit of wishful thinking because we don't have any way to compensate them or anything, which is why we have to be that. Um, and another thing that this has kind of reminded me, um, 
there are days where I'm just completely not confident, just complete lack of confidence. Um, and I think, why am I doing this? This is uh, not because it's hard, but just because I, I feel like I feel inadequate. Um, and even this morning, I was like, oh my gosh, wait, this is, what am I doing? And um, you'll go through that a lot to, to start something. And um, you really have to push through. And, it, and everyone does go through it. So don't be surprised by it. Um, and the best thing to do is to talk to other people about it. Because I kind of closed up at the end of last year and um, didn't really talk to people about it, and that wasn't a good thing. So it, I'm much better now, and a lot of great things have happened. Um, but you know, talk to people because they're the ones that either have been through it or um, they'll at least be able to guide you and help you in, um, in what direction you need to go. So, yeah. So where is G3Box today, and where do you expect to be at the end of your Edson? Um, year, yeah, the year. Edson year, yeah. Um, so today, G3 Box is, you know, like I said, we're still working on our first two clinics. One's going to be going to Kenya. Um, we're still looking for those sponsors. We're still looking for the nonprofit route versus the for-profit route. We have some for-profit opportunities. Um, we have some really interested parties. But where I expect G3 Box to be at the end, so that'll be in like th four months three months, um, there's a, uh, an existing organization called IMEC, which stands for International Medical Equipment Collaborative. And um, they, are, uh, they basically receive donated medical equipment um, from all over the United States, and they get it to their warehouse, they make sure it still functions, and then they um, put it into medical suites, and they ship, ship it to organizations all over the world that run clinics and hospitals. So um, they're very interested in what we're doing. They've wanted to do uh, containerized solutions. And um, in, in that, by that time, there's a chance that we'll be, have a pretty significant collaboration with them. Um, and they've, got, they've been doing this for 20 years, 800 different projects, 90 different countries. So they know how to get stuff done. And they have a very strong international reach. So an organization like that coming to us and saying, hey, we kind of want to like have you as part of our programs is a big deal to us. So, and that's kind of the break we needed uh, because for the longest time I was like, okay, I've been working really hard, I've been doing this, I just haven't gotten to that point. Um, and it really made me question like, am I putting my time, should I be putting my time into this this way or should I be like having a really good engineering job that's gonna pay me that then I can give to these types of organizations? So I really wondered and um, because of a believer. I call IMEC the believer that I needed. So um, a lot of people will say, oh, but what about this and what about that? And they bring up all these obstacles when you tell them about your idea. And then you finally talk to that one person that's just like, oh my gosh, I love that, that's so cool. Like, what do we need to do to get this done? And you're like, oh my gosh, I love you. Because you didn't even bring up anything that though it's still there, they know that there's still obstacles. They want to just make it happen. And IMEC has the ability to actually do that. So we're really excited about that. So Thank cool. You. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too, we're actually, um, actually yesterday and this morning, we, we shot some video for a, um, a video trailer type of thing that tells you a little bit about us and the clinic that I told you about. Um, and we're going to start an Indiegogo campaign. Have you guys heard of Kickstarter or like the crowdfunding idea? So we're going to do that, but on Indiegogo. And it's more general. It's more like cause-based. It's not necessarily product-based like Kickstarter. But we're going to be launching that in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I'd love to send that over to Hannah. And then maybe you can blast it out to your networks and stuff. Um, and really, it's not just about raising money. It's about raising like excitement and awareness about what we're doing um, as G3 Box. So. I'd love it if you guys could support us in that way. Thank okay, you very much. Before everyone goes, we're doing something that Wise does. One thing you're taking away from today. I'll start. Um, today, I'm taking away. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. I mean, you are. Um, that it's really inspiring and awesome to have someone who's so close to my age be so grounded and sure in their vision. Even though you said you have some trip ups, you just come off very confident, and that's really reassuring to see someone going after.
bless you. Okay, that is great to know. I'd love to have your card. Is that your card that you want to give to me? Or? Thank you very much. I work with uh, a company that uh, hires the Inuits in uh, northern uh, Alberta, Canada. Okay. And that would you, that's why I wanted you to show me the map because I saw you had one right there. Uh huh. And uh, the company builds living quarters and hires the Inuits. Okay. And that would be ideal to have uh, something in their, their area. I think, did you ever speak to one of my teammates? I did. I yeah. Did. Yep. You know, we lost your information, so no, you this is it. really good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, if I had a magnet, I'd attach it to you. Yeah, well, here, let me give you my card, too, okay. and then we can't lose each other, but. <laughs>